problem in other parts of the world, not so much in Hawaii, not in white fishing, things like that. Um, sedimentation is a huge issue. Um, you know, way back when we had a lot of sugar cane and pineapple, and it was even worse. Um, it's getting better in some places. Coastal development, I remember 100 and plus years ago, Waikiki was probably one of the most important estuaries in, certainly on Oahu, but maybe within the Hawaiian Islands, and so that doesn't exist anymore. Um, alien species, a lot of limu choking out the reef, and then the 800 pound gorilla of climate change, which we don't know how reefs or fish are going to respond in the future. Okay, um, so commercial fishing in Hawaii, um, by far and away, the pelagic, so um, the open ocean species like tunas, this lady's pelagics would be things like ono, um, wahoo, uku, jawfish, things like that, and then the billfish account for the vast majority of the fish that are landed in Hawaii. Um, and the kule and Apelin, which are the coastal pelagic species, probably represent commercial stocks. And then you can see, even though inshore fish, what a lot of people really care about for things like culture and subsistence, um, aren't really that important commercially. Um, bottom fish, even though important commercial fishery, small in tonnage, sharks and alua, not much. Um, so let's focus in now just on the near shore stock. So things within a couple of miles from shore, the coastal things that we mainly see. And you can see the corn fish fishery is by far and away the most valuable commercial fish fishery in the state. Next is a Kule and a Pelu, three fish. Lobster, this is old, these are old data. I would say lobster stocks are actually even in poorer condition than they were back then, so commercial lobster take is probably less. Ee, octopus, um, Okihi, limpet, and then we will account for round out what the major um, inshore species are from a commercial perspective. What do you mean by value? Like the amount Yep, that's the dollar value that each of those fisheries is worth. Um, okay, we have this amazing data set in Hawaii that doesn't really exist anywhere else on Earth um, for reef fish that go back to 1900. So back in 1900, um, after Hawaii became, you know, annexed, um, Commercial Fisheries Bureau came out and conducted fisheries surveys at the major fish markets in Honolulu and Hilo. So we've got data from 1900. Um, I was able to piece together some data from the teens, the 20s, and the 30s from various sources. And then the states of the territory in 1948 started collecting commercial data um, at that time and have done so continually um, today, which is an amazing data set. Starting in the late 60s, they actually um, collected those data on a per trip basis, so you can calculate basically the success rate. So fisheries are evaluated based on what's called you know, catch per effort. So if you go out fishing for X amount of time, how much fish you have that time should be proportional to the stocks that are there. In other words, if you have a bunch of fish, given an hour of time, you should catch more fish than you would if there's less fish. Make sense? Catch rates. So that's what's called CPU and catch per hour. So let's focus on the left side of the grass here, so the commercial line. So for things like carangids, so that would be alulas, albula or oeo, the three campids are veo veo, um, typhosis nenui, or nenui, depending on which island you're from in Hawaii. Um, we have this uku, moi, agakos, hole hole, and then kumu, which is an endemic species. Um, on that. So, I think it's clear from all of these figures that um, the, the overall catch has declined dramatically for a lot of these species. Most, uh, a lot of them by 90 percent since 1900. So, over the last hundred years, the stocks have declined by 90 percent. Okay, a lot of people say, well, you know, after World War II, um, there was a lot more economic opportunities. Commercial fishing wasn't as important. Um, you know, we got a lot of food from the mainland, different sources. So, um, so you can't look strictly at the catch and equate that to what's on the reef. But, like I said before, the catch rate should be proportional to the abundance of fish. And when you look at catch rates, I look for the major deer types, so either handlining, leg, yield, net, or spear. 
And you see for all of them, for the most part, they have declined substantially over time, at about the same rate, about a 90% decline in catch rates. So um, they, they corroborate each other. Some of the interesting things here, see that big spike for UU up there? That's like in the 70s. That's sort of when uh, scuba fishing started to take off. So you get really high catch rates when everybody can go out and scuba fish, and then they plummet very quickly. Interesting is things like Nanui are actually doing a little better, so these herbivores with faster turnover rates have replaced a lot of the more important species that used to exist, although Nanui are important for a lot of people around the world. That make sense? Great. Um, this is basically the same thing, just showing that, um, I keep putting up these needles like this, and I just apologize for it, but, um, you know, you look at the commercial catch rates, and for most of the species, they're 1% of what they were um, at their peak, which is between 1900 and 1930 or something like that. Okay, so um, the commercial catch, we'll get to in a minute, but um, it only accounts for a small proportion of what's going on on the reef system. And so why is that? If you look at commercial fishers, licensed commercial fishers, since 1965, we don't see a big change going on. But what we do see is this huge increase in the amount of pleasure vessels. Now, not everybody who's got a pleasure boat is going out fishing, but a lot of people are. And so you just see that the amount of recreational boating has increased, and you know, concomitant with that is an increase in fishing effort from the non-commercial side. Okay, so this is another new figure for Cindy and Kurt. Um, so we just finished up um, a study in Kehoe Bay um, on um, Big Island the last couple of years, and the community was monitoring the fishing effort within that area over the last few years. And that big red area is the reporting block. So what gets reported to the state every year by commercial fishers is like, okay, we caught X number of fish in block one or two. And so you see these blocks, actually they're bigger than Mofu for the most part, but um, so these blocks are huge. Um, and this is the scale or the unit of management that the state uses. So you look at Little Kehoe Bay and it's two orders of magnitude smaller than the total commercial catch. It's only 2.7 square kilometers versus 200 square kilometers for the total reporting blocks. And when you look at things like line fishing, throwing out eight spear fishing, in almost all cases, the catches in Kehoe Bay are larger than what's reported to the entire commercial reporting block for that year. So, um, you know, we are catching a lot more fish than is being documented. So you can't manage what you don't know. Um, and that's why we're focusing a lot on community managed efforts, because communities do a lot better job of managing their local areas than the state does, because the data that the state has is junk. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really correlate with what's actually going on. Does that make sense? So this is some stuff that's just going to be published to play in the next year or two. And then the other cool thing is from this study is we look at fish flow, where fish went out of Kiholo Bay on the Big Island and what people did with it. So you see Kiholo Bay is down by there. Now nobody lives there anymore, so most of the lineal descendants from that area live in other parts of the Big Island. A lot of them live up in Kamuela, um, now in other parts of the Kona Coast, but it's a state park now. And so there is a local a community who cares for the place, but nobody lives there anymore, so it's, it makes it difficult. But that said, so we interviewed fishers, we figured out, well, we asked them what they did with their fish, whether they kept it for home, whether they gave it away to the Puna or neighbors or, or whatever, or whether they sold it. And you'll see that the further you get away from Kihola, the more likely you sold it. Actually, the only place that fish really got sold was in the market in, in Hilo. So, you know, if guys are going to come all the way over to make it worth their while, they're going to sell it. But it's interesting that the distribution of fish along the North Kona and South Bahala area. So Little Kihola, we calculated, provided over 30,500 meals for the community within one year. And when we look at the um, standing stock and things like that, um, it's not particularly good. It ranks fairly low statewide. So the argument we want to make is, just think if it was well managed, how many more meals would it provide for people? Okay. Um, 
So current management regulations um, aren't very good. First of all, nobody pays any attention to them. Second of all, they don't make a lot of biological sense. So this is an example from, from stuff I did in Hunt Lake way back when. And this shows the size frequency distribution for Omilu, which is a, a very important fish, both culturally and recreationally and subsistence-wise. And that's how many fish. This is out of like a thousand fish that we measured. Um, so this shows the distribution for those years. This was the state minimum size limit in 1992 and 1994. And you still see that the vast majority of the fish were below that legal size. So most of the fish were illegal to begin with. The state increased that regulation to 2000, in 2004 to their credit. SFR is size at first reproduction. So um, they don't reach sexual maturity until that size. So the state regulations don't make any sense. 98% of all the fish that were caught never got a chance to spawn. It's hard to have a sustainable population if you can't reproduce. Um, so this is a, a talk we gave to this down at the legislature, um, talking about the importance of big fish. So, um, you know, big fish are much more important than little fish. Um, the, it's kind of a, it's a fifth root, um, fifth power function. So um, it's not linear. So it's not like a big a fish twice the size of another fish makes twice as many eggs, makes five times as many eggs. And um, so important. So we made the point that that one omilu there has the same reproductive output as 86 of the little ones that I'm holding up there. So if you throw that big one back, you can catch those other 86 and you'd be on a little even playing field. So really, big fish are really important. And that's uh, what you get that. Um, OK, Moi. Uh, reserved for the Ili'i in ancient Hawaii, so a uh, very important fish culturally in the past. Um, they're, so they're sex changers, so they change from males to females. The opposite of things like uru, like, like parrotfish, which change from, um, from female to male. Anyway, these are data from the 60s, um, and you'll see juveniles accounted for a small proportion of the cast, a little lavender there. Uh, the reds are the big females, uh, hermaphrodites are the light blue, and then the yellow is the mask. So shift forward to late 1990s, and you'll see there's a lot more juveniles in the population, a lot fewer females, and everything is smaller. And that, that applies in every single case. <coughs> you know, more juveniles, more males, less hermaphrodites, and less females, and everything's smaller. OK. <clears throat> so from an ecosystem perspective, how does, you know, how does fishing affect the ecosystem? This is a, a shot from Carolina Atoll in the southern Wine Islands where we did some work a couple years ago, and sharks dominate. You know, over half the biomass on the reef consists of, of sharks. You get the water, and there, there's tons of sharks. So you got this vibrant reef, though, with you know big sharks, lots of fish, lots of coral. Sharks and big fish are the first thing that go. Um, they're valuable. They're easy to catch. Uh, then you end up with mesocarnivores, tend to be the next group of animals that are targeted. Once you get rid of those, mainly herbivores are what's left, so things like manini. And then the reef's still functioning okay at that point. You know, manini is grazing on all the lingo. But once they're removed from the ecosystem, that's when the wheels come off. So that's where the system kind of collapses. Um, because lingo tend to dominate the reef and take over. And then once that happens, all the puka in the reef gets filled, and the reef just becomes non-functional at that point. And what we can see from some of the work that we did, when we look at large herbivores, those are 15 centimeters, things um, you know, like the manini, that there's you know, a strong correlation between the presence of large herbivores and the absence of macroalgae. So the more large herbivores you have, the less macroalgae. Um, so there's a direct correlation, and fishing pressure is going to remove those larger. Okay, so uhu or parrotfish. I had a spelling area that I didn't know before, but okay. Anyway, um, so parrotfish have these really interesting dentition. They have these fused teeth, and they can uh, tear off really big chunks of the reef. So they're major bioeroders on the reef. They produce an enormous amount of sand. This is a these are bumphead parrotfish found in the Indian Pacific. They can be over a meter long each. 
Um, and just, they call them buffalo parrotfish because when they storm through, they just create this giant sand cloud and you kind of hardly see anything. It's pretty impressive. Okay. So there was a student here a number of years ago working on the red lip uhu, and she found that, so it's not, not linear with these guys either. So you need to be of a certain size before you can actually have an effect on the ecosystem. So one 50 centimeter or 20 inch red lip uhu makes almost 900 pounds of sand in one year. So, well, so why, you know, some of the sand that you're laying on the beach, unless you're Waikiki, is coming from uhu. Um, um, it's also coming from the cow and even things like that, but still, um, so it's really important. And that sand fills in all the interstitial spaces in the reef that provides habitat for shrimp and crabs and a lot of food sources. So it's really critical to the whole function of the ecosystem. Okay, so Hawaiian Archipelago, we've got this nice case here where we've got the uninhabited northwestern Hawaiian Islands and then the main Hawaiian Islands where we have people. And it's obvious, uh, we've got overfishing going on in the Mainland Islands, unfished in the Northwest for the most part, lots of humans, no humans, land-based impacts, not much, alien species still have invasive species. And so the first thing you notice when you jump in the water in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands is you're not at the top of the food chain. And um, there's lots of big animals in the water. So, you know, there's a monk seal, there's a little following the monk seal, Lots of sharks. So it's um this is more or less what a natural intact ecosystem looks like. And we've repeated this exercise in various other places around the world. And same holds true when you don't have people, your the reefs are dominated by sharks and, and lower large animals. So um, what we see is overall in between the northwest and main Hawaiian islands, the standing stock of fish, the amount of fish that you see on the reef is, you know you know, three to four times higher in the northwest and the main. But the most striking thing is just apex predators. So sharks and the lua dominate in the northwest one islands, and they count for about 3% of the biomass in the main. So they've been, pretty much been eliminated from many places in the main one islands, but, but still have them in, in certain places. But even the primary consumers, like the herbivores, the need, things like that, and humu, the secondary consumers, things feeding on shrimp and crabs, still are more abundant in the northwest of Maine. So you think with all these predators, you know, you should have a lot fewer prey. But actually, the system just responds. Everything lives fast and dies young, turns over faster, higher growth rate. So that's how the system just functions more efficiently. And that's why when you have all the pieces of the puzzle in place, these systems are more resilient to things like climate change, hurricanes, all these other events that take place. So it's, it's best to keep everything there because you don't know what it's used for. Um, okay, so here's some new analysis that we've been working on um, in Hawaii. And we've taken all of the visual survey data that people have been collecting over the last 15 years. It's about 20,000 different surveys. It's a really great data set. And so we were trying to figure out what's the sampling unit? How do we, how do we analyze this? And so after a lot of statistics and so forth, we said, let's, um, let's look at how the Hawaiians did it. So uh, land-based things were managed at the aupua or watershed level. But marine resources were typically managed at the moku level. So mm -hmm. these are all the moku in um, the main Hawaiian Islands. And there's a little dispute about um, these moku boundaries. Um, some, some debate, um, look, some of them have changed because of lava flows and things like that, but there's also just um, different recollection of what, you know, what constituted which moku. But, so these are basically them. Um, and we color coded them by their weight exposure, so north exposed, east, south, and um, Lanai and Kolabe have other things. Okay, um, so this has been the label we've been working on over the last year or so, and hope to get published out pretty soon. So this shows the biomass of resource fish. Resource fish are fish that people are going to eat. Um, by Moku in the main Hawaiian Island and comparing that to the Northwest Hawaiian So you see the big purple line up there, Northwest Hawaiian Islands, obviously unfished, no people, a uh, lot of, you know, high biomass. But we broke this up into tercile, so, you know, the upper third, middle third, bottom third of the standing stock by Moku. And the first
first obvious things are where you've got low human population density, you have pipelines of fish, so areas of Molokai, Koalabe, and Nihau have high standing stock fish. So even within the main one islands, we still have places that look really good. But if you notice all the places that are junk, where are they? They're on a walking and Maui because you know we've got a lot of people. Um, so it's not just fishing. I was talking about before. There's land-based pollution. There's habitat destruction. There's all those other things. Regardless of what the causes are, we don't have a lot of fish in those areas. So this is pretty amazing. Um, and then you know it scales with human population density. So more people, less fish is basically it. Okay. So. Um, there's a lot of communities in Hawaii now who are trying to revitalize traditional practices of how things were managed. Um, and it was basically based around recognizing natural rhythms and processes and, and not disturbing those processes. Processes of renewal, usually reproduction or movement, and monitoring cues such as moon phases, seasons, habitats, and the knowledge was acquired through intimacy. If you're out on the reef every day, you know a lot more than the scientist who jumps in the water once a year at that place. And also passed on from generation to generation, so you don't have to, you know, figure it out every time. Um, so, ancient Hawaiians were pretty clever as far as not only the way they fished, but the management practices they had. So you can think of all the ingenious ways. Uh, you know, they were bottom fishing. You know, long before we had monofilament lines and, and large boats. Um, you know, created fishing lures that could catch 200-pound aki. Um, just with a war bone, turtle shell, and things like that, and all the different techniques that were used, it was, it was pretty ingenious. And the management strategies were also, you know, quite complex and, and very clever. So, Kahanihi management, Kahanihi was kind of the emissary of the elite within that aqua, and that person was responsible for managing the water that went in, you know, that came down, how the forest resources uh, were utilized, and, and how the reef resources were and they acquired this knowledge through Kupuna, through master fishermen. And master fishermen were important because, remember, the major source of protein came from the ocean. So, um, you know, so it was survival. And so that's why the kapus, the breaking of the kapus had pretty draconian consequences. Um, you know, it was all based on, on survival. So they took it pretty seriously. Um, and a lot of it was based around lunar cycles. So uh, one moon calendar broke things up into the rising portion of the moon, the full moon period, and the falling portion of the moon. And you can see some of these couple periods, they kind of align with different lunar phases in a made sense, because these when a lot of things are doing their business, when they're spawning and so forth. This is some work one of my students, Eva Schimmel, is looking at, working with some community. So this is the spawning cycles for Manini. Now, um, Manini have a real protracted spawning season. They spawn almost, you know, at least at least six months out of the year. And and they spawn during the new moon and during the full moon. So you can see the gonads here for, for Manini, the, the hydrated eggs there, and then that, that's the histology slide on the bottom there. So you can see new moon, full moon, Females are good to go, and during the resting, you know, the other phases of the moon, they're not. Males, like humans, are good to go all the time, so it doesn't really matter. But um, but the females are the ones that are really important. Okay, so um, this is in Momomi on the North Shore of Molokai, where the community is trying to. Um, there's a lot of other communities in the state. They're trying to kind of marry traditional practices and Western science to, to build sustainable management practices. And trying to revitalize traditions, but also incorporating that with things like we, we tag some more there. You see the little, little yellow tag up there. And moi returned to the same moi hole uh, the following year. So it puts a lot of validity to the fact that, um, so moi aggregate in the springtime in these very rough areas like that. But moi holes, they segregate the females and the males. They figure out what's going on. They're usually spawning in June, July, and August, and then they split. So they don't disturb those moi holes, and we showed that they come back to the same hole every year. So it's worth your while to take care of the place. Um, and in one moment, they developed a spawning calendar. So um, for things like Alua, Ulu, Kalani, Nanui, Ulu, the red highlights the months of the year when peak spawning occurs, and then the kind of orangish were months that it also spawned. 
So the, it, it's not really prescriptive as like, it's a complete couple, like you don't fish them during those months. It's like, these are the months you probably, sh you know, should lay off them and not fish as hard because they're spawning. Um, so and then understanding natural rhythms and processes. So, um, you know, uh, Moili, the juvenile moi recruit to sandy habitats. Um, they change sex in about a year to monomoy, so Hawaiians recognize these life cycle, you know, these life changes had names for each of the different life history phases. Polymoy are the hermaphrodites, so you can see the smooth male tissue, and then the orange uh, female tissue, and then the uh, Hawaiian just become complete females at about age three. So understanding each of those different bottlenecks in the life cycle really helps you manage those better. Um, traditional conservation strategies were Recognize the importance, remember I talked about the importance of big, big fish, big females make a lot more eggs, so releasing the big females back instead of getting your picture on the cover of Hawaiian fishing news. Um, and you know, not disturbing the nursery habitats. And a lot of communities are using moon calendars as tools for um, identifying and kind of um, you know, relearning traditional or um, you know, wise or pono practices. So what are the what are proper, you know, strategies that you want to have. So like for, for a meal, you know, don't take the small ones before they spawn, you know, take the medium ones, let the large ones go. And so these moon calendars are starting to be developed by communities all over the state, and they're kind of guidelines for proper proper codes of conduct when you go out fishing. Um, okay, um, we have all of these marine managed areas in the state, which I think I did to every one of them. Um, and it seems like a lot for the most part, but in actuality, it's really not. Um, so you can pretty much do whatever you want in 90% of all the coastal waters around the main and one islands. No take areas account for less than 1%. Um, partial protection and then restricted access are going to be places like Pearl Harbor or Barton Sands, um, Missile Testing Range on Kauai, and places like that. So <coughs> it's, it's not as good of a management as you've seen, but we did an evaluation of all the protected areas around the main one islands um, about 10 years ago. And for the most part, we can see they all work. Uh, biomass within those areas is 300% higher. Large fish are 250% greater in protected areas versus open areas. So um, it's kind of indisputable that uh, protected areas work within the water. Um, and some work better than others. Um, if fishing pressure is really high outside, the protected area looks a lot better, like Hanama Bay versus Monolulu Bay. Uh, the, reason, the biomass is eight times greater in there than outside. Same like for Honolulu, Pukupea, as you'll notice, most of these areas where the ratio is much greater inside than outside are on Oahu and Maui, where you've got all the, the pressure. Places like uh, Malpakahi is on the big island, and Maui is on the island at the Kona Airport. Galapagoa and Wailea also the big island. So um, not as big a difference, but they all still work. That, that white line represents the one-to-one -one line. Um, okay. So let's see this. Um, so we can see, you know, we use the water in Hawaii a lot of different ways. Um, there's cultural practices, there's tourism. President Obama body surfing in Sandy's. Um, there's uh, open ocean aquaculture. You know, you name it, and we do it. And so the trick now is, as we have more people and more uses and more multicultural uses, uh, how do we how do we balance that, and how do we you know allow compatible interests to use the same area, and how to restrict the incompatible uses. So. Really, the approach forward needs to be something like um, what's called marine spatial planning, where um, fishermen always complain, rightly so, that um, you know they're um, kind of singled out as the major cause of all the problems. And it's a combination of things. Um, so all the stakeholders need to get at the table, right? You know, jet skis and a Kool-Aid fishermen are probably incompatible. So you have to find where there's different uses and where you can segregate those uses so that everybody can play nice. And um, we're not there yet. Um, you know, as you guys know, like a year ago, some of the guys in Molokai had an issue with some fishermen coming over from Oahu. So this will happen more often as resources become more scarce around the islands. Um, but we've got a lot of data. And um, we've got imagery, we've got all this human dimension data now. 
Um, and we can put that all together to come up with maps and come up with plans. But, and communities are doing this. There's a lot of communities around the state who are doing this at the local level, but um, they can't do it without top-down support. The state of Hawaii doesn't really have a comprehensive ocean policy. There's no director of this of the Division of Aquatic Resources at present. The um, chair of the Land and Natural Resources hasn't been approved yet. So um, I think it's going to take you guys to start screaming and yelling because the state's going to go down kicking and screaming because they don't want to cede authority. But um, what we've shown time and time again is local communities manage the resources much better than centralized government. Um, so this is just summarizing the whole show. Um, hopefully I'd like you to see that uh, what we're currently doing is not sustainable and not working except in you know, some local places. Um, ecosystem services are things like food, uh, culture, but also uh, shoreline protection, you know, tourism, things like that. All these things, you know, the ocean provides for people in Hawaii in a lot of different ways. Um, and we need to incorporate this into our thinking, into the future, and in my mind that's just, um, you know, in the way that people used to think about things in place, it's, it was all very place-based. Um, so I think that's the way forward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's got a couple minutes, so. semester's worth of, um, of work, so, um, or, or, or class, so, we have five minutes or something like that, so if anybody have questions? No. No thought-provoking things that I said, huh? <laughs> Where do you get your data from? Because, like, how, how much fish is getting taken to be sold to the market or anything else? So, um, Case by case, I mean, a lot of this stuff is, is my data, and I don't want, you know, there's lots of other people working on these issues as well. The stuff in the Kilo Bay, like on the Big Island that we did, um, we worked with the local community, and they did most of the interviewing of the people, and so a lot of the community based projects that we're working on are community initiatives that we kind of help support. It's been called the movie about yesterday, and that community is trying to um, start to get stuff going and working with um, So, kind of just help. You know, provide tools that can support community efforts. But um, some of these things are much bigger than that. Um, so you can protect all the communities you want, but if everything else around them is going to help, you need a more comprehensive long-term policy. But it's not the lack of data that's preventing us from moving forward. It's the lack of political development. Yes? Does a lot of fish countries have to stop reporting? Do you find that the data that you collect in the field, like of fish numbers and animal numbers, is adding up to the self-reporting? Like, what people are thinking? That's stuff we're working on right now. It's a great question because the classic fishery science scientists just want to know um, what the commercial catch was, and so visual surveys haven't really been well accepted as a tool. We're doing a lot of lens-based work now, which uh, gets away from some of the questions people have about sampling that. All these things are time consuming um, and take a lot of effort. Um, but you can collect a lot of data just looking at, and looking at the size structure of animals is becoming you know, more, becoming clearer and clearer. That's really a, a quick approach to what we call data, managing data for fisheries, which are almost all coral reef fisheries. Because all these fisheries stock assessment models were designed for cod in the North Atlantic, where it's like one species, you've got big trawlers going out, they're landing at one port, so you have really good data. And we still do a miserable job managing those fisheries. So managing these complex multi-species, multi-year fisheries is even more so. Yeah? Uh, because Oahu's fisheries are so much more depleted than the rest, do you see uh, people on Oahu managing their resources differently from the neighbor islands? At this at all? I mean, yeah, I, um, I, 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 I'm a little cynical. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you see a lot of people going to neighbor islands, for yeah. one thing, um, because they have more. You know, the thing about Oahu and even Hawaii in general is, um, remember, things used to be, like I said, very place-based in the community. Um, but a lot of people now will go from one fishing spot to the next, from one weekend to the next. So you don't really have the same care for the place as you would if you're, if you're fishing that all the time and it's your refrigerator, right? So you don't care for it if uh, you're going to go somewhere else. 
Uh, yeah, and, and the Wahoo is a really challenging the most challenging place to do things. And there are a lot of efforts put by communities around, but it's um, it's more difficult. One of the first community efforts was in Wilmot, in Wolotai, and I always said if it didn't work there, it wouldn't work anywhere, because it's a homo homogeneous community. It's a one Hawaiian homeland, it's a thousand people, one dirt road. It's kind of rough most of the time on the North Shore of Molokai, so either rain soil in the summer or rain soil in the wintertime. And so it's really isolated, and, and it's taken them 20 years to really you know, get it nailed down. So um, it's a long, slow process. Um, but I think the state needs to encourage more of these activities because there's more and more communities um, you know, care about their research. But look, um, not every place is amenable to a community managed area. You probably don't want a government-regulated no-take area on one ID or one But it's probably hard to get a community-based management area in one to keep. So, um, you know, you need the right tool for the right job.